Venice certainly has a track record for pulling in the visitors. The pilgrims of the Middle Ages were the first to go there. In the 14th century, 200,000 visitors watched the city's ruler, the Doge, lead a vast boat procession on Ascension Day with a symbolic marriage of the sea ceremony. A season of festivals and fairs was invented from April to June to entice more visitors. By the 1500s, there were over 20 hostelries, mostly near St Mark's Square and the Rialto, offering good food, clean linen, and a plentiful supply of prostitutes. They teetered on dangerously high heels. These shoes were not made for walking. The first guidebook was published in 1581, and in the next century, Venice became the centre of the Grand Tour, an essential component in the education of an English gentleman. It offered new cultural experiences and licentious adventure. The city's artists grabbed their easels and created images directly designed to appeal to tourists. Francesco Gardi, saw his city as a place of romance and of almost theatrical scenery. And Antonio Canaletto opted for idealised city views. He sold them to the rest of Europe, especially England. At carnival time, to celebrate Lent, Venice could pull in more than 30,000 visitors but it was in the 19th century that mass tourism really began. The city was the most desirable destination on the Grand Tour for the upper middle classes. For these Victorian travellers, Venice became an acceptable relic of the past. Cultured and respectable, it offered a refuge from the horrors of industrialization that were then afflicting England. They were, in a sense, the new pilgrims, their spiritual journey to the capitals of Europe ending at Venice. Their religion was the city's art and history. But at the same time, Venice was in conflict, the crumbling of the old and its undeniable beauty, alongside the desire to modernise. The art historian John Ruskin one of the most influential visitors and writers on Venice, looked down his nose at modernisation. He was appalled at the prospect of arriving in the city by train. He feared that new-fangled gas lighting would make Piazza San Marco look like Birmingham. Ruskin deplored factories. He applied an absurd rejection of wealth-producing modernity to Venice. He even opposed the creation of the water bus service to the Lido. This same water bus, reviled also by the American novelist Henry James as intrusive modernism, is the one we enjoy so much today. Henry James complained that the Lido was being improved and the deserted beaches and dunes were turned into a mere site of delights for visitors. These improvements, of course, created prestigious international hotels and the location for the world's oldest film festival. The novelist wanted Venice kept in a state of picturesque poverty he resented modern plumbing because it would deny him the sight of washerwomen laundering outdoors. He resisted industrialization because it would reduce the number of artisans whose back-breaking manual labour he enjoyed contemplating. 
Never mind that water buses and factories might help Venetians prosper. Filthy old conditions were better for art. The misery of Venice, James said, stands there for all to see. It is part of the spectacle. Some might say it is part of the pleasure. As Ruskin realised and feared, since Venice is an overbuilt island, you can't negotiate with its geography. You can't build anything new without destroying something old. Native Venetians maintained in a state of grinding poverty and denied every modern convenience might be a terrific artistic stimulus for American and British writers cocooned in their luxurious hotels. But their plight did little to help Venice itself prosper in a meaningful way. In the city's pharmacy museum are gruesome medical exhibits preserved in huge glass jars. Clearly, Ruskin and James' attitudes were pickled in formaldehyde as well. But in vivid contrast, the poets and painters of a new 20th century phenomenon, the Futurist Movement, raged against these sentimental views. Instead, they championed a dynamic future for Venice. The futurist leader, Filippino Marinetti, saw the status of St Mark's Bell Tower as a fetish, a perfect example of the Venetian veneration of the past and denial of the present. It had collapsed in 1902 and a worldwide campaign raised funds to have it rebuilt as an exact facsimile. Marinetti posthumously attacked Ruskin he died two years before, claiming he would have wanted to reconstruct that absurd campanile of San Marco, as if to give a little girl, who had lost her grandmother, a cardboard doll, which resembled the dead relative. On the 8th of July, 1910, Marinetti launched a condemnation from the clock tower in the piazza, with a leaflet drop, thousands of them, Accompanied by a silver trumpet, speaking through a megaphone, he delivered a bitter assault against the pressures on the city. The pamphlet, in Italian, English and French, was an attack on the current state of the city. It floated down into the piazza. It read, We turn our backs on the ancient Venice, exhausted and ravaged by centuries of pleasure-seeking, the Venice that we too have loved and possessed in a great nostalgic dream. We reject the Venice of foreigners, marketplace of fake antiques, magnet for universal snobbishness, bed worn out by her procession of lovers, great sewer of traditionalism. We want to heal this putrefying city. We want to give new life and nobility to the Venetian people, fallen from their ancient grandeur. We want to prepare for the birth of an industrial and military Venice, able to dominate the Adriatic. Let us fill in the stinking little canals with the rubble of its crumbling, pockmarked old palaces. Let us burn the gondolas, rocking chairs for cretins. Raise to the skies the imposing geometry of metal bridges and factories plumed with smoke. And celebrate the sensuous curves of new architecture. Let the reign of divine electric light begin at last to free Venice from her corrupt hotel room moonlight. Make no mistake, Marinetti was demanding the total demolition of Venice and its replacement by a modern town. He followed the leaflet drop with a performance at La Fenice Opera House. We want electric lamps with a thousand rays of light that can brutally stab and strangle the mysterious, pestiferous, alluring shadows. Your Grand Canal, 
dredged and widened, will inevitably become a great mercantile port. Trains and trams launched on the broad roads that will be constructed over the former canals. At last they will be filled in. They will bring you many products and the streets will swarm with crowds of shrewd, wealthy, busy businessmen and industrialists. Venetians, why do you continue to wish to be loyal slaves of the past? Seedy custodians of the greatest brothel in history. Nurses in the saddest hospital in the world, where mortally corrupted souls languish with the pestilence of sentimentalism. Your gondoliers might be compared to gravediggers in a flooded cemetery, digging ditches in rhythm. Once, long ago, you were invincible warriors and artists of genius, daring navigators, capable industrialists and energetic merchants. And now you have become pimps, tour guides and hotel waiters. Free Torcello, Burano and San Michele, the island of the dead, from all the sickly literature and endless romantic nonsense that have been draped over them by poets, poisoned with Venetian fever. This, this has been your glory in recent days, O oh Venetians. You should be ashamed of yourselves. You should cast yourselves down, one on top of another, like sandbags, in order to make an earthwork around the borders of the city while we prepare a great and strong Venice, a military and commercial centre for the Adriatic, that great Italian lake. Well, Marinetti didn't hold back on the histrionics, did he? And he wasn't alone. There had been discussions about re-energising the city in the final decades of the 19th century anyway. Filling in the canals and lagoon, culverting the Grand Canal, providing carriageways, developing industry, opening up the Adriatic, all these ideas had been suggested. But, as we've just seen, in the new century the Campanile had fallen and had been resurrected. It was the old, and not the new, that was being endorsed. Even the mildest modernist had a hard time getting a hearing in Venice. The lobby for old Venice had staying power. And now, 100 years on, typical images of the city are now fixed forever in the public imagination. In this new century, the Disneyfication of Venice is complete. It is still a working city, but it now has a new character. Each year, millions of people enter a city of 60,000 inhabitants, so at any one time, there are more strangers here than citizens. In a way, they are like those medieval pilgrims their holy journeys in pursuit of mosaics, marble and miracle-working madonnas are waymarked by the saintly names of water bus stops on the Grand Canal. Tourists now do see the real Venice. The tourist Venice is the essential, quintessential Venice.